Hello, hello, brothers and sisters around the world. Welcome to Lifeline Bible Ministry. Uh, today's lesson uh, is about walking with God series. Let me share my screen very quickly and let's get into the lesson. So today we are dealing with walking with God part number four. Please subscribe, like, and share this video, and God will bless you. We need Patreon donors to help us do what we do. If God is leading you to become one, please contact us. For the series, we began with uh, part one, which is higher calling in Christ. Part two, deepening personal relationship with God, part number three, praying with Christ, part four, which is today, grace, the power to overcome, part five, struggle of the soul, authentic rapture readiness, and then we're dealing with part six, which is resistance, sin to death, part seven is spiritual warfare in our walk with God. So today we're looking at grace, the power to overcome. The rationale for the series, we take taking it from Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. 23. And all the days of Enoch were 300. 60 and five years. Verse 24, and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Enoch walked with God. Can people walk, walk with God? Yes. God is calling us to walk with him at a personal level. And the Bible says Enoch was not. Why? Because God zapped him off the planet. What does that mean? What does that imply? This is the biblical evidence of the first person to be raptured by God, taken out of the planet into the very reality of God. Enoch was the first person. Are we going to be part of the rapture of Jesus? Then we have to learn how to walk with God and please the Lord so that we can be rapture ready. We have first Peter chapter four, verse seven. It's about the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Three key things in this very verse. The end of all things is at hand. The question is, are we living in the last days? The answer to that is yes. Then the Bible is simply telling us the end of all things. It's right here. Two things we need to do. One, we have to be sober, very reflective, thinking about things happening around us. Those of you sold into politics, those of you sold into religion, but not after Christ. The, the word of God is encouraging you and I to be sober. Open your eyes to see what is happening around you. And number two, watch unto prayer. The time to pray is right now. It's not a time for you to do politics and do all these debates. The time for us to pray is now. Anytime and season the church must cry out unto God, is today. Whatever is happening in the United States, look at it from a global perspective and from a prophetic biblical perspective. What is really happening on the planet? How do we pray? How do we watch unto prayer? That is a question every true born child of God needs to address in our life and in our lifetime right now. 
So the time to pray is now. God is calling his church to pray. If you are part of God's church, you will pray. What about the prophecies concerning Trump? Three, four questions. Are these true messages from God? Two, are these prophets attention grabbers or they are genuine from God? Is everyone having a dream about last days? Which of these must be believed? About the prophecies? Prophecy is a call to prayer. We read in 1 Timothy chapter number 1, verse 18. It says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, on you, Timothy, that thou by the prophecies or by them mightest war, a good warfare. Paul is telling Timothy, prophecies had gone on ahead about you, Timothy. And by the prophecies, you need to fight. Somebody said, but I thought this God speaking. Yes. Prophecies declare God's intention. That means the enemy becomes aware of what God wants to do in your life, and they will resist. They will fight. So you have to fight. So if prophecies are given about Trump or are given about you, and you just sit and sleep, thinking it will come to pass, just like that, you'll be in for a shock. You have to pray. You have to wage a good warfare to make sure the prophecies come to pass. Your prophecies are not simply to tickle your ears. It's a call for you to pray. Let's look at our lesson for the day, Grace, the Power to Overcome. So this is part four in the series. A brief outline, we have the preamble, the opening statements, which I just did. And then number two, we're going to go into grace. We're going to look at the source of grace. Where does it come from? Three, the message of grace. What is grace saying? Is grace able to speak? Is grace a person? Number four, grace, divine input into your life to reign, for you to reign in life. Five, grace, the power to overcome. Six, grace, the working power of God in us. Let's jump right into it. The source of grace. This is a statement from a Roman Catholic source. This is what the, the, the Vatican, the, the Pope, the Roman Catholics, this is what they are saying. They say the key to understanding all these graces is Mary's role as the new Eve. Listen carefully. Mary's role as the new Eve, which the fathers, talking about Roman fathers, Catholic fathers, proclaim so forcefully because she is the new Eve. She, like the new Adam, was born immaculate. Listen carefully. That means Eve, uh, sorry, Mary was born without sin. Just as the first Adam and Eve were created immaculate because she, still talking about Mary, is the new Eve. She is mother of the new humanity. They call in Christians new humanity. Just as the first Eve was the mother of humanity. And because she, still talking about Mary, is the new Eve, she shares the fate of the new Adam. Whereas the first Adam and Eve died and went to dust, the new Adam and Eve, still referring to Mary, were lifted up physically into heaven. Listen carefully. The Roman Catholic Church is telling you Mary is the new Eve. Mary is the mother of all Christians. That's what they are telling you. 
And they're also saying Mary was born without sin. They're also telling you Mary was physically lifted into heaven. Where did they get all this nonsense from? Mary died and was buried. Mary is not the second Eve or the new Eve. No, we don't have any new Eve anywhere. We don't have that. This is from the Roman Catholic Church. Doctrines of demons. No biblical basis whatsoever. Don't be deceived. Another quote from Catholic Encyclopedia. Is it according to the Catholic Encyclopedia under the topic of Hail Mary? It says, Hail Mary, full of grace. That statement, full of grace, is not in the scriptures. Mary is not full of grace. They say, The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Embodies the words used by the angel Gabriel in saluting the Blessed Virgin. Mary was not a virgin forever. Mary had other children besides Jesus. The Roman Catholic Church derives all sorts of teachings concerning Mary from the phrase full of grace. Two of them are here. She is conceived without sin. She lie. That she was redeemed from conception and was without sin. That is also a lie. Why would she perform purification rituals if she is sinless, according to the scriptures? So to Roman Catholics, Mary is full of grace. They want to make her equal to Christ. Mary is not full of grace. Again, doctrines of demons. Another Catholic source, he said the mass of the Roman Catholics is the source of all grace. I need for you to pay attention. According to Roman Catholics, Mary is the source of grace, number one. Number two, the mass, the Eucharist, the wafer that they give them, the communion to them is the source of all grace. Another big lie. So the source of Catholic grace is Mary and their Eucharist. These are lies from the pit of hell. Now let's dive into the scriptures. John chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I speak. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. For he was before me, and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What is the Bible saying? This is talking about John the Baptist, prophet John the Baptist, speaking about Jesus. Say John bear witness of Jesus. And John cried saying, that means he lifted up his voice. This is the person I'm talking about. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, speaking about Jesus. Now verse 16, and of the fullness of Jesus have all we received, listen carefully, and of the fullness of Jesus have all we received. That means anyone receiving God's grace, Grace cometh from Jesus. So we have received grace from Jesus. Every human being, including Mary, including you, my brothers and sisters, grace for grace cometh from Jesus. Verse 17, he said, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Moses gave the law by grace and truth and, and, and true reality of God came by Jesus. 
truth did not come by Moses. The totality of what God wants us to know and the power of God to live life on the planet comes from Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the source of grace. Jesus Christ is the source of truth. We need to remember that. Anyone seeking God's grace, anyone seeking the truth, is Jesus. We look at the book of Romans, chapter 14. Sorry, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. It says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Talking about the first Adam and the second Adam. Verse 15, but not as the offense, so also is a free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, how much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ had abounded unto many. Again, what is the Bible saying? The Bible says death was able to reign from Adam all the way to Moses. All the way unto Moses. Death reigned. And Adam was a figure of him who was to come. Who was to come is Jesus, talking about Jesus Christ. So through the offense of one person being Adam, many be dead. Much more the grace of God and the gift of God, which comes by grace. So we're talking about two things, the grace of God itself and the gift of God, which comes by grace. All of that is by one man, even Jesus Christ. And the grace of God and the gifts and the gift of God that comes by grace. Jesus has made it available unto many, had abounded unto many people. Once again, what is the Bible making us aware? That the grace of God comes by Jesus only. And the gift of God, which grace produces, also comes by Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the source. Romans 6, 12 to 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the last thereof. 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What is the Bible saying? The Bible is saying, as a child of God, don't allow sin to reign in your body. Don't do it. Don't obey the lust of the flesh. Don't do it. Oh, the, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Nobody is perfect. I can sleep with any man. I can sleep with any woman. I can get drunk. I can do all these. I can have abortion. I can do all these. No, sir. He said, don't yield. Neither yield. It is you. Don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Don't do it. Why? Because you are under grace. Under grace, sin has no power. According to verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Those under the law, sin have dominion over them. But under grace, in Christ, sin has no power. 
so that people begin to do the works of the flesh. All these lustful feelings, evil thinking, anger, all these different things, busting out of people. No, under grace you subdue sin. Why? Because of the power of grace, which coming unto you and I from Jesus Christ. Under grace, sin has no power over your life. That's why children of God will not bow to sin. Why? Because of the power of grace in us. We can say no or can say yes to sin. But the scripture is encouraging you and I that we should not yield to sin. We have the power not to yield. It's not like Oh, it overcame me, and I, and I flipped, and I got angry, and I started cursing. If it's repeating in your life, then there's something wrong there. That means you are saying the word of God is not true, but the word of God is true. So the issue is not the word of God, but the issue is you and I understanding that under grace, we have the power not to sin. Because sin cannot have dominion over you, a child of God. Why? Because we are under grace. Under grace means we have the covering of grace over us. The power of God is shielding you and I. That's what under grace means. Come under it. Place yourself under God's grace. Sin will have no dominion over your life. No, sir. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 9. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and had raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindly, in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Once again, what is the Bible saying? The word of God is making us aware that God is rich in mercy and he had loved us with great love. Even when we're dead in sin, it is something. God quickened us together with Christ. When we were spiritually dead in sin, God made us alive. How? The Bible says, for by grace ye are saved. So that means the unsaved is dead in sin. They are spiritually dead in sin. When the grace of God comes upon your life, you get quickened with Christ. Not only that, grace also will raise you up with Christ and make us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So grace saves us, grace raises us up together with Christ and make us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Powerful, powerful statement. That in the ages to come, he, God, will show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us. How? Through Jesus Christ. That's why the text says, for by grace are ye saved. It is the grace of God that saves us as we place our faith in Christ. It is God's gift unto us. Christ Jesus is the source of grace. 
Grace destroys the power of sin. Grace destroys lust. Yes, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Grace will destroy it. Every true child of God will not serve sin. The proof you are God's child is you will not be servient unto sin. No way. Grace resurrects the spiritually dead to become alive with Christ. Grace positions us with Christ in heavenly places. Grace saves and delivers us. Are you under demonic uh, are you under demonic influence of whatever sort? Are uh, evil spirits harassing your life? Grace will deliver you. Why? Because grace saves and grace delivers. Ephesians chapter 5. Sorry, Ephesians 3, verses 5 to 7 which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Six, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. What is the Bible saying? Say in the ages past, God did not show it to the sons of men. So that means from Adam all the way on to John the Baptist, before the New Testament, the New Covenant Church came into being. People did not understand. People did not know what Paul is talking about here. That Gentiles should be fellow heads with the Jews. The Jews never understood that. And today they are still debating that all oh, these people are not, they are non-Jews, so they have to do uh, kosher and do all these different things. Sir, no. So the Gentiles should be fellow heads with the Jews. And that we become fellow partakers of the promise in Christ. And where do we find the promise? By the gospel. And Paul says, that is uh, where he was made a minister. According to, listen carefully to verse 7, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto Paul. How did Paul have that grace? So the grace of God is a, a gift, a spiritual gift. Listen to what the text is saying. According to the gift of the grace of God, so the grace of God is a spiritual gift that was given unto Paul. How was it given unto Paul? How was the grace of God working in Paul? He said, by the effectual working of the power of God. So the grace of God as a gift was given to Paul. And the grace is operational by God's power. What does that mean for you and for me? Whatever gift of God, whatever grace, we have grace for different things. Whatever grace God has given you as a gift, as a spiritual gift. The spiritual gift is in operation by God's power. That's what the Bible is saying. So that the grace is a gift by itself and, and the grace that is upon you or in you becomes operational. It is worked by God's power. It's like you have an engine in a vehicle. How, like, like the grace is a vehicle, a car. And what to cause the car to move is the engine in the car. So what to cause the grace of God to be operational is God's power. 
the power of the Holy Spirit. So grace is put into action by the power of God. So whatever grace you are prayed for or God has bestowed upon you, there are different graces that God gives unto the body of Christ, unto his people. Different abilities and capabilities are bestowed unto people by God himself. And the graces and the giftings are operational or put into action by the power of the Spirit of God. That's what the scripture is making you and I aware. Somebody say, oh, all the gifts I've seen. You are crazy. Read the Bible again. What is the message of grace? We go to the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation had appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Again, what is the Bible saying? The Bible is saying the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all people. So the grace of God has appeared. That means the grace of God is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. The verse 12, that the grace of God is teaching us something. What is the grace of God saying? What is the message of grace? The grace of God is saying that we have to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. My brothers and sisters, listen carefully. The message of grace is no license for people to live in sin. That is not what grace teaches. The message of grace is not we are work in progress. The message of grace is not. No one is perfect. That is not what grace is saying. Grace is teaching us to deny ungodliness. Anything we know to be ungodly, we have to deny it. We have to resist it. So anything that is ungodly, that is worldly lust. Lust in the world, lust of the flesh. Sexual lust, lust of the eyes. Oh, it looks so this, so this is what I want. It looks so that, it, no, pride of life. The Bible says, grace is teaching us to deny these things. On the contrary, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. So grace is teaching you and I to live soberly. But I can, I can drink some wine. What about that? I can drink some whiskey. Son, live soberly. Live soberly. Live righteously. And live godly. In this present world. Not only that, we are looking forward for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So the Bible here, according to verse 13, is telling you and I that the great God and our Savior, the great God is Jesus Christ. Is Jesus God? Yes. That's what the Bible is saying. 
and our great God gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. And these people are zealous of good works. What is the Bible saying? Grace calls for separation from the world. Grace calls for holiness. Grace calls for expecting the imminent return of Jesus. Unfortunately, some people are expecting the Antichrist instead of Christ. Grace calls for the calls us to expect the imminent return of Christ. It could happen at any moment. No warning signs for the rapture. Remember, you're walking with God, you are rapture ready. Never forget, grace is calling you unto total repentance from the things of the world. And grace is calling you and I to live in holiness. Number three, grace is telling us to expect Jesus Christ to return for us. Three, distinct messages of grace. That is the message of grace. Grace is not a license for you and I to be engaged in sin. No. By the power of grace, we do not yield our members unto unrighteousness. So grace is Jesus. Grace will give you the passion and the zeal unto good works to glorify God. That means every child of God is made by God, listen carefully, for you to be passionate and zealous unto good works. What does that mean? It means as a child of God, on fire for Christ, as for me, I'm not going to be part of this. It's just me and my family, son. No. God has a mission for you and I on the planet. Children of God, dive into the mission of God, participate and partake with zeal and with passion. Look at the mission field. Look at your local church. It's not about excuses, excuses, excuses. You participate. Can God count on you? What are you doing to live the name of Jesus in your local church? What are you doing to live the name of Jesus with missions, activities around the world? My brothers and sisters, can God count on you? For some people, they're waiting to become millionaires before they will support God's work. No, sir. God is calling you and I. Grace is Jesus. Acts chapter 20, verses 24 to 27. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. 25, and now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. 26, wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. 27, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. What is the Bible saying? The Bible is talking about Apostle Paul when it was about time for him to finish his race. So he received the ministry, his ministry from the Lord Jesus to do something, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. 
So the gospel Paul was preaching was the gospel from which we receive God's grace. So the gospel of Jesus is the source by which we can receive grace of God. We need to understand that, that the gospel is the message of grace. Now, if that is what Paul was doing, then the verse 27, he says, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That means that the gospel of the grace of God is the counsel of God, God's wisdom, God's mind for you and I is the gospel of the grace of God. So declaring the whole counsel of God, we are talking about declaring the gospel. And from the gospel we hear and we have access to the grace of God who is Jesus Christ. The gospel contains the grace of God. Grace of God is communicated when the gospel is preached, unadulterated. Not the another gospel, but the true message of Christ, which brings salvation unto the whole world, is the gospel preached unadulterated. Grace, divine power to reign in life. Ephesians 3, verses 5 to 7. Which in other ages was not made unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. I want to say this again. Grace, as a gift of God, works by God's power. So the power of the Holy Spirit is what activates the grace of God, is what causes the grace of God to be functional in the person is by the effectual working of God's power. That's the point I want us to see. So for me to reign in life, what is the grace of God that I need? So I need two key things, the grace of God in that particular aspect of my life, and then God's power to make sure the grace I receive is functional. So we need to remember, Grace is divine power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to do anything God expects us to do. That means the child of God, you don't throw in the towel, you don't give up, you don't say, oh, I'm having these challenges, therefore I'm going to cry, and I go on Facebook and I make posting, and yeah, 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 I'm crying. Son, back off. Is that God's grace at work in your life? Is that God's power at work in your life? Those things should not be happening. The challenge doesn't mean you are a loser. It means an opportunity for the power and the grace of God to be demonstrated in your life. The mountain is not the issue. The issue is God's grace is available. Are you tapping into God's grace and God's power to deal with it? or you are simply crying your head off. Some of you, you get suicidal. Some of you, you get into a depressive state. No, no. Grace is God's power to help you and I do whatever we need to get done. Whatever we need to get done. Whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. The grace of God enables us to be able to do it. Romans 5, 16 to 18. 
and not as it was by one that sinned. So is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by one, sorry, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. What is the Bible saying? The Bible is saying here that through the free gift we receive of God, we get justified, just as if we have not sinned at all. It is a free gift that comes from God through Jesus Christ. Now, the verse 17 is that if we receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, if we receive it, we shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. What is the Bible saying? The Bible is saying, my brothers and sisters, if we, if you and I receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, we reign in life through Christ. Abundance of grace will propel you and I, will cause us to reign in life. And the grace is coming from Jesus. And the grace is Jesus himself. So for me, for you to reign in life, I need abundance of grace. It's a free gift. You don't pay money to receive it. Oh, the pastor say I need to sow a seed so that he will pray for me. No, you ask God directly. If the pastor is asking you for money before he prays for you, that is not the pastor. That is a witch in the pulpit. That is a con artist in the pulpit. That is a pimp in the pulpit. It is a free gift. Free gift means free gift from God. You don't pay money for. So you and I can reign in life through the abundance of grace that come from Jesus Christ. We don't have to go through all the heartaches we are going through and bow our head in shame and in disgrace. Why? Because we are not losers in Christ. Through abundance of grace, we shall reign in life. We reign in life through the abundance of grace of God. We subdue every power holding us down, whatever demonic power it is, whatever satanic strong man it is holding us down, we break through by the abundance of grace of God. We are able to overcome them. We bring them under our feet. That's what Jesus said. Behold, I give unto you power to tread over serpents and scorpions. That power that Jesus gives us is the grace of God that we shall tread over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That power Jesus gives for us to subdue every demonic power that opposes our life is the grace of God. Through the grace of God, we subdue sin. We don't bow to sin. We don't bow to the pressures of the world. We overcome and we reign in life through the abundance of the grace of God. Grace, the divine input to perform. Acts chapter 14, verse 26. And thence sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which 
they fulfill. What is the Bible saying here? Talking about Paul and one of the other disciples or saints. Something took place here. These men were recommended to the grace of God for the ministry. What is the Bible giving us insight about? The Bible is saying in the early church, people were prayed and recommended to God's grace for specific missions, for specific ministries. Very important. Very important. People are prayed for and recommended to the grace of God. Look at another text here, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. The, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Wait a minute. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Again, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying he is who he is by the grace of God. Not because he learned so much stuff under Jewish rabbis. No, See, he is what he is by God's grace. Listen again. And his grace was bestowed upon him as particular gift of God was put upon Paul. And that gift, through that gift, and by God's power, he worked more than all of them. But I say, yet not I. It wasn't I who was actually doing it. But it is the grace of God that was with him. So if we combine these two verses, what is the Bible saying? We need to be recommended to God's grace for the assignment that God has given us. What assignment has God given you? The assignment for you to be a mother, the assignment for you to be a father, the assignment for you to be a preacher, whatever the assignment is. We need God's grace to perform. Paul is making us aware that he, being the apostle, and the gift of God, with all the revelations, with all the demonstration of power, is by God's grace. So the performance of Paul is by the grace of God. It comes as a passion for you to do something. It comes as fresh ideas from the spirit for you to do something. It comes as the power of God upon you for you to ex execute something. You don't start a project and back off and the project dies off. No, when the grace of God is at work, remember, it is the power of God working effectually within you. You will not sit down until the work is done. You will not give up until the work is done. What vision has God given you? about your ministry, about your children. That's why by the grace of God, we reign in life. God, the power to perform come from God's grace and power, not us. Acts 15, let's look at verse 40. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So Paul, and Silas were recommended by the brethren unto God's grace. A particular prayer as, as a culture of the early church was anyone called into a ministry. The culture was they are prayed and recommended by the church unto the grace of God. 
It's like they given, they prayed into God's hands for that particular mission to be successful. My brothers and sisters, don't just walk away. Oh, I have a calling from God. I'm just going to go straight away and do it. People laying hands on you, people praying for you, impartations are important. That was the culture of the early church. Today, out of arrogance, people cannot sit under teachers because they know it all. Church practice recommending individuals to the grace of God. Why? For them to be successful in ministry, for them to perform by the grace of God. Performance in every area of the life of a believer is by God's grace. The arrogant is cut off. Because in their mind, they figured it out. They know all of it. They've seen it all. Nobody can tell them anything. They're the smartest people in the world. They are cut off from God's grace. Why? Because God will resist you. If you are arrogant, God cannot use you. Grace is the working power of God in us. Colossians 1, 27 to 29. To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Listen carefully. So we preach Christ, and we are warning every man. Why? So that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Some people, they cannot be perfect, so they are excluded from this. They cannot be perfect, so they are excluded. Just kidding. But the point here is, by God's grace, every man is presented perfect in Christ. If we humble ourselves and yield ourselves to Christ, the Lord will empower us by his grace so that you and I will be able to become perfect in Christ. Now listen to Paul in verse 29. He says, whereunto I also labor, striving to his working, God's working, which worketh in me mightily. What is Paul talking about? There's something that was within Paul, moving him, stirring him up, igniting within him the passion for him to move on and fulfill his calling. And that is God's grace. It worketh in him mightily. So that's what the text is saying. Grace is the mighty working of God in us. That is what grace does. By grace, we're able to perform. By grace, God will work within us, our mind, our soul, our spirit, for us to wake up, for us to stand up and do what God expects us to do. That is what grace does. That's why we, through Christ and by his grace, we can reign in life. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. He said, therefore, being justified by faith, we are peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What is the Bible saying? The Bible says we are justified by faith in Christ and we are peace with God through Christ. The verse two, very powerful. He said we have access into this grace in which we stand. We have access into the grace of God by faith. So we access God's grace by faith, 
It is not by doubting God. It's not by you have fought the battle by your own strength. And now it's not working. And you think that's the end of the rope. No. We access grace by faith. Exercise faith in God for God to give you the grace to prevail and to overcome. Hebrews 4, chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What is the Bible saying? The Bible says, we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ. Let us therefore hold fast our profession that we are believers in him. He can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, things which are not working well. We can touch Jesus. We can pray to Jesus. Why? Because he was tempted like we are. So he understands us. That's what the verse 15 is saying. Now the verse 16 says, because of that, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. The, 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 the power center of the universe is the throne of God's grace. Because from that throne, God will release grace unto you and I. God will release his power. God will release his enablement. God will release what we need to get things done so that his name will be glorified. That is the throne of grace. That is the throne of grace. So we access God's grace by going before the throne of God. He said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. I need grace to do something. I go to the throne of grace. And what happens at the throne? I will obtain mercy. So from the throne of grace, God will show me mercy. I will obtain that mercy from God. And I will find grace to help in time of need. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> no. That's not what children of God do. I will go before the, the throne of grace. I will approach God boldly and, and, and just ask God, I need your grace, my God. Why do I need grace? I, see, and that we may obtain mercy and find grace. We will find grace to help whatever I need to have done. What do I need from God? to make sure what I need to have done is done. That's what grace is. And I will find it at the throne of grace. That means this is a call unto prayer. So we access grace by prayer. We access grace by praying. All we need to do is to pray and ask by faith. I need power to preach. I need power to be patient. I need power. I need power to overcome sin. Son, pray. By faith, ask God. The arm of flesh will fail you. You think you know it all. No. The human flesh has limitations. The arm of flesh will fail you, son. Don't trust in your human abilities. Trust in God's power. God is calling you and I by his grace 
that we should come boldly by prayer to obtain grace so that we can prevail and we can reign in life. That's what God is calling us for. Seek God's grace continually. My brothers and sisters, we shall end here. I believe you are blessed by God's power. Thank God for your life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be unto you and unto your family. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.